<laughs> Revelation chapter 12. Now, uh, we, we are kind of picking up here in the midst because uh, I started chapter 12 last week. Way too much information to get through in one week. So we're kind of picking it up here as it were. Uh, more or less in the middle of the chapter, I think we're we'll, going to pick it up about verse 9 or so. But just for a couple of brief uh, review things, uh, so we get back on the same page here. Remember that uh, here in the book of Revelation, chapters 10 through 14 are what we refer to as parenthetical chapters. In other words, these chapters kind of uh, are, I don't want to call it an interruption, but a pause, shall we say, in the narrative. And then as God pauses in the narrative, he fills in a lot of information for us. Like, who are these different people? Who are these different characters? What are these different things that are going on? How did they come to pass? This is what we're getting here in the parenthetical chapters. Especially, you certainly don't want to miss next week, because we're going to be covering the Antichrist and the false prophet. Where did they come from, and how did those guys show up on the scene? So that's, that's next week. But um, as we've been looking at the, 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 the parenthetical chapter 12 here, um, we've got all of this awesome symbolism that was described to us as symbolic, starting off in verse 1, now a great sign appeared in heaven. So we know that we're on symbolic ground when God's Word announces that it's a sign. So we identified, right off the bat, three different characters in the greater scenario of the tribulation period in the book of Revelation. Uh, first of all, we identified, of course, the woman. The woman was identified as the nation of Israel. Not difficult to determine that or to interpret that. And again, if you want to backtrack on that a little bit, the video is already up on YouTube from last week, and you can get the audio back here with Barry, too. I don't know, if, is the audio up on our page yet? Uh, no, I don't think so, because I don't okay. think we'll put it up. Okay. I don't the audio have keys anymore. You can get a CD back there, you can go on YouTube, it's all there if you want to see it. Uh, so the, the woman is identified as the nation of Israel. Again, not difficult to figure that out. Then the son that this woman was having, this woman was uh, being with child. She cried out in labor uh, in pain to give birth back up there in verse 2. Uh, and we know that she bore a male child in verse 5. Again, not very difficult to interpret that symbolism. That's Jesus Christ himself coming out of the nation of Israel. And then, of course, we have the dragon that appears in verses 3 and 4. Uh, again, not difficult to figure out, especially since he is identified for us a little bit later on in the chapter. So even as we um, look at verses 3 and 4, we say, okay, well, who could this be? Who could this dragon be symbolizing? Well, verse 9 gives us the interpretation. The great dragon was cast out, the serpent of old called the devil and Satan. So once again, God's word, the best commentary on God's word is God's word, and he gives us that identification for us. <laughs> then... After we've identified these three primary characters, as you might call it here, uh, then we see this great conflict that happens in verses 4 to 6. Now, this conflict represents conflict both past, present, and future. So it's not just all uh, something that's going to happen in the future, not all something that's going to happen in the past. Because, again, we're in parenthetical chapters here, uh, some of this information has to do with how these things came to be in the first place. So when he's talking about a woman giving birth to the son, the woman being Israel, the son being Jesus, we know that that took place, for us anyways, roughly 2,000 years ago. Uh, at the time of the writing of the book of Revelation, which we estimate to be somewhere in the early 90s A.D., uh, that was an event that had taken place some, well, I, you've heard me say before, Jesus wasn't born in the year zero. You know, before Christ, after Christ. It didn't quite work out that way. But roughly um, 90 years before, more or less, uh, the birth of Christ had taken place. So, you know, we've got information that's both past, present, and future. So there's this great conflict that takes place between uh, this woman who is Israel, the son that she gave birth to, and the devil, the dragon who was there to oppose or an attempt to, con uh, to consume the son as he is born trying to cut off the Messiah from the work that he came here to do. And we know that Satan's ultimate defeat uh, was, uh, first of all, in Jesus' death and his subsequent resurrection from the grave. Uh, killing him was one thing, but you couldn't keep him down. Uh, you heard me mention before, you know, you never want to mock God at a funeral because you never know what he's going to do. And in the case of Christ, for whatever moment of celebration the devil may have had at the fact that he actually succeeded in killing Jesus, it didn't last long. So where we're picking up the narrative here tonight, we'll pick it up in about verse 7. Let's read from verse 7 down to the end of the chapter. 
Revelation chapter 12, war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought, but they did not prevail. Nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brethren, who accused them before our God day and night, has been cast down. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives to the death. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea, for the devil has come down to you having great wrath, because he knows that he has a short time. Now when the dragon saw that he had been cast to the earth, he persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child. But the woman was given two wings of a great eagle, that she might fly into the wilderness to her place, where she is nourished for a time and times and half a time from the presence of the serpent. So the serpent spewed water out of his mouth like a flood after the woman, that he might cause her to be carried away by the flood. But the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed up the flood which the dragon had spewed out of his mouth. And the dragon was enraged with the woman, and he went off to make war with the rest of her offspring who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. The angels broke out in a, in a big bar brawl in heaven, and... Uh, as we have seen with any situation of spiritual warfare, it really isn't much of a contest. Are you guys still thinking about that bar brawl comment? <laughs> 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 you, you are, you are. <laughs> bar brawl. Well, uh, it's, it's interesting because, uh, and I think I may have touched on this last week a little bit, Michael the Archangel is always identified with the nation of Israel in one way or the other in places like Daniel chapter 10, Daniel chapter 12, Jude 9. Uh, he is seen not only defending Israel, but making announcements concerning them. Uh, but verses 7 to 9 here in Revelation chapter 12 focus clearly on a future conflict, <coughs> not a past conflict. Now, it's interesting because here's where we get that uh, description of Satan in, in verse 10 as the accuser of the brethren. Now, Here's a couple of interesting things for you to think about in this context. After the church is raptured, uh, unless we die before the rapture happens, I'm gunning for the rapture personally. I don't want to do any more funerals. Had enough of them the last few years. Let's just all go together. We have an amen for that? Amen. Yeah. Uh, that would work for me. But the point is, <laughs> after the church is raptured, then believers stand before God for reward. We're judged for reward. We're not judged for punishment when we stand before God. Our punishment was meted out upon Christ on the cross, Isaiah 53. So when we stand before God, we stand before Him for reward. Now, the accuser, as he's called here, the accuser of our brethren who accused them before our God day and night, there in verse 10, he can accuse us all he wants, but we've been acquitted by Christ. We've been acquitted. What that means is he put away the sentence that was properly due to us. We rightfully deserved whatever it is that God was going to do to us because of what we've done. We've violated God's laws, as I like to say. We violate them with impunity. And so that punishment that we rightfully deserved, that was put upon Christ on the cross. We're going to talk about that Sunday some more. But in the meantime, when we stand before God for judgment, our judgment, it's going to be for reward. Romans chapter 14, uh, verses 10 to 12 uh, why do you judge your brother? Why do you show contempt for your brother? For we shall all stand before what is called here the judgment seat of Christ. Amen. We will all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Now, it goes on to say, for it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. So then, each of us shall give an account of himself to God. Therefore, let us not judge one another anymore, but rather resolve this, not to put a stumbling block or cause uh, anybody of, uh, any of our brethren to fall. Now, further on, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 10 to 15 is the classic on our standing before God for, um, uh, for reward. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, 
to get up about verse 10, according to the grace of God, which was given to me as a wise master builder, I've laid the foundation and another builds on it. But let each one take heed how he builds on it, for no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hair, straw, each one's work will become clear for the day, that's the judgment seat of Christ, the day will declare it, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. If anyone's work which he has built on it endures, he will receive award, a reward. If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. Now that's a fascinating passage, because not only is there reward for those of us that uh, are doing our best anyways to build our life and our life of service to Christ and on top of Christ, the foundation of Christ himself, so that the things that we do in our life, we're doing, uh, Lord, I want to do this for you. These are things that I want to do for you that will glorify you, that will honor you, especially if we think about that before we do them, we might not do some of the things we do. But to be able to do whatever it is we do for the glory and for the honor of God, knowing full well that we'll be rewarded for it. Now, for me personally, I'm like, Lord, I don't need a reward. I just want to be there. I just want to get into heaven. But the fact remains, God's promise, He's going to reward us for faithful service. Now, some, as 1 Corinthians chapter 3 seems to indicate, some are going to get there, they're not going to have a lot of reward to show. Their, their clothes may be tattered, their smoke coming off them, they're smudged and burned a little around the edges, but they're in. Amen. I've, I've, you know, I've, always, I've always kind of visualized myself running towards the gates as they close, sliding in, and even having the gates pinched shut right behind me, get the car in my shirt, smoke coming off of me, I'm burning everything, and I I made it. I'm here. But look, that, that is not the way that we want to enter the kingdom of God. What we want to do is we want to be able to enter standing up and have the Lord say to us, well done. Amen. Good and faithful servant. Enter into your rest. That's what I want to do. I don't want to do all that other crazy stuff. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10 again. We're going to be rewarded by God in heaven. Now, the accuser accuses us before God day and night. And we need to be, I think, quite honest about something. We give him plenty to accuse us of. It's not like Satan's up there accusing us before God and he's having to make stuff up. You know, It's like all he's doing is telling God what we're actually doing. And God's like, I know, I know, that's no, not good. We give Satan all the ammunition that he shoots at us. And so the more, uh, you know, I don't want to, you know, beat us over the head too much about it, but the more stupid stuff we do, the more he's got to fling right back at us. So when he's accusing us before God, day and night he's got plenty to accuse us of. He accused Job before God in Job chapter 1 and 2. Yet, Christ is our advocate. Now, let's not forget this. 1 John chapter 2, you guys know this passage, 1 John chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, My little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, an advocate. That's like, that's a legal term. It's like our, our uh, defending attorney. And, and he wins every single case. He never loses. And he himself is the propitiation of our sins. We're going to talk about that Sunday. What does it mean? What does the atonement mean? What does it mean to have our sins atoned for by Christ? So, even as Satan accuses us before God, Jesus stands in heaven and says, no, that one is mine. Does Satan accuse me before God? Day and night? Absolutely he does. And Jesus says, no, that one's mine. He belongs to me. Now, we're going to come back to that here in just a minute because there's another interesting thing to add in there. Christ is our advocate. So, how furious will Satan be when he can accuse but not overcome those who are covered by the blood of the Lamb? How angry is that going to make him? The picture before us here, from verses 7 and 9, the picture before us here is that this conflict will finally remove Satan and his demons from any access that they had previously enjoyed in the heavenly realm. Think about this just for a minute. And I'm not going to stand here and tell you that I've, I've got this 100% right, but I believe that this is correct. 
to this day, to this moment, Satan has access to the throne of God in heaven. That's why he's the accuser who accuses us day and night before God. When we look back to Job chapter 1, we see Satan standing before God. How does he get there? Well, he's got access. He's got access. But there comes this moment here in Revelation chapter 12. War broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought, but they did not prevail, nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. They had access up to this point, and access is over. Your backstage pass has been removed. You don't get to come up here anymore. So what happens then? What happens as a result? They were cast down to the earth. Now they no longer have that access to heaven. Well, that's good news for those in the heavenly realm. They don't have to put up with him showing up every once in a while. But it's bad news for the earth dwellers. Because those who dwell on the earth, he's cast down to the earth. It's interesting too because down there in verse 12, which I'll get to in just a second, they're referred to as the inhabitants of the earth. And again, in the book of Revelation, we've seen this type of phrase come up more than once. The inhabitants of the earth are those who live for this world. Not simply human beings that exist on this planet, but the inhabitants of the earth are those who live for this world, not for the next. They've rejected or are consistently rejecting God, and they are those that inhabit this world for this world. So how furious is Satan going to be? Furious. Now, the role of angels, again, is interesting. This conflict that which we see in verses 7 and 9, it's not fought by God, and it's not fought by Jesus. It's angel against angel. Because remember, Satan was an angel at one point. Now he's a fallen angel. So it's brother against brother, as it were. Angel against angel. And the angels in heaven, those that remain faithful to God, it's no contest. Satan and his angels are cast down and cast out. This angelic, demonic conflict. It's interesting because it's seen in places like Daniel chapter 10, verses 12 to 14, as Daniel is waiting for an answer to prayer. But the answer was delayed because of a spiritual battle in the angelic realm. Fascinating. Uh, here in this passage, uh, commentator C.A. Coates comments about Satan saying, as accuser, of, as accuser of the brethren, he is in opposition to Christ, our priest. As the one who brings forth the first beast, he is in opposition to Christ as king. And in bringing forth the second beast, the false prophet, he is in opposition to Christ as prophet. Everything he does is in opposition to Christ. Every little thing. Satan has his unholy trinity as he fancies himself to be God. He has his son, as it were, who will be the Antichrist. He has, as it were, his holy or unholy spirit, as it were, the false prophet. So he has his unholy trinity. And as we understand what Satan's goal is and what his history is, what his past is, it makes a lot more sense when we see some of the things going on in the world that we do. Because there's some things that happen in this world that can have only one explanation in my mind, and that is they're straight from the demonic realm. If you don't believe in the devil, and I told you before, I had trouble with that when I first got saved. Yeah, I didn't believe in the devil when I first got saved. It was too weird for me. There was enough weirdness going on in my life. I didn't need any extra. You know? So I didn't believe in the devil right off the bat. But I was thoroughly convinced within 24 hours. And that's about how long it took for me to be completely convinced that the devil was real. Because I just never experienced any kind of what I perceived as opposition. I never perceived opposition at all. Because I was merrily doing whatever you know, the devil wanted me to do. I, he, he left me completely alone. He didn't bother me at all. Because I was just doing whatever he wanted to do anyways. One step towards Christ and all of a sudden, all heck breaks loose. Or AG double hockey sticks. Um, What's interesting to note once again, if I can come back to verse 10 just for a split second, as he's called the accuser of our brethren before God, day and night. He accuses us before God, day and night. Here's an interesting thought for you. Back in Revelation chapter 4, in verse 8, the four living creatures, each having six wings, were full of eyes around and within, and they do not rest day and night or night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. They never stop worshiping God day and night. Oh, wait a second. What is Satan doing? Accuser of our brethren. He accuses them before God day and night. I, I just had this thought, this vision in my head, 
that every time Satan opens up his mouth to accuse the brethren, all of a sudden the four living creatures are going, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty! And Satan's like, I'm talking, I'm talking here. And so I just had this vision of every time Satan opens his mouth to accuse the brethren, these four living creatures just break out in this worship and praise, this chorus of praise that completely drowns out the sound of Satan trying to accuse us before God. Amen. And I just thought, you know, you know, in the angelic realm, God and his angels are always going to have the upper hand. Oh, you're talking? We're singing! <laughs> and I just, I thought, I don't know, I could be completely wrong, but I just thought it was awesome to think that. Satan, the devil, his angels, they're cast down to earth. Now, verse 10, we're going to pick it up with point number 6, and that's called war worship. We see this periodically throughout the book of Revelation. These different moments throughout the narrative, all of a sudden in heaven, there's this outbreak of praise and worship for a variety of different reasons. And we're given them here. Then I heard, verse 10, a loud voice saying in heaven, Now salvation and strength and kingdom, uh, salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brethren who accused them before God day and night has been cast down, and they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. Now, John sees Satan and his angels cast out of their access to heaven. This is followed by what is described as a loud or a great voice making a pronouncement. Now, the identity or the, the individual or individuals behind this loud or this great voice is not given. But it is likely that whoever it is that's proclaiming this probably uh, is a redeemed saint because of what they're saying. Uh, an angel wouldn't necessarily say what this person or these people are saying because it seems, to me anyways, that the voice of this, this loud voice saying this is someone who has some sort of experience in this. Now it could be an angel. This angel's got to stand around and listen to Satan do what he does. They've got to watch what he does. But it just seems like somebody here that's saying this has some sort of experience in this. Now, there's no certainty, so it doesn't really matter one way or the other. But the salvation that is spoken of here, uh, the salvation that is described here in verse 10, now salvation and strength in the kingdom of our God, this is not the salvation that you and I experience being saved from uh, the guilt of our sin, but rather this is the idea of now we've come to the completion of the divine plan. That God's divine plan that he started in centuries and millennia past is finally now coming to its conclusion. Uh, we're at the very tail end of the story, the last couple pages of the chapter. Uh, this passage also may indicate when he says, salvation, strength, kingdom of our God and power of his Christ have come. That also may indicate a particular strengthening for those who remain on earth at this time but are believers that there is some sort of unique moment where uh, as Satan and his angels are cast down specifically to the earth, that God is also granting at that same moment a particular strengthening to those who are his that remain on the earth at that time. Hard to say, but there's some interesting things in the language that, give us that, that gives us that idea. That idea seems to kind of carry through here in verses 11 and 12, because immediately after saying, uh, the accuser has been cast down to the earth. And then it says, And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. They did not love their lives to the death. Now, um, the point here, I guess, that I want to get to for you and for me is um, we have salvation in Christ. And because we have salvation in Christ, Satan can be overcome. Now, it's not that... Guys... Some of you probably remember the old Flip Wilson program. Flip Wilson show. You remember Flip Wilson? Remember one of his big routines, The Devil Made Me Do It? The Devil Made Me Do It. Well, as a believer, um, the devil can't make you do anything. He can certainly tempt you to do it. And he's very, very good at that. And we're very, very good at stumbling at whatever he throws in front of us. Um, but the fact is, we don't have to. We have within us the crucified and resurrected Christ and the power of the Spirit. So we don't have to. So if we want to get angry about falling and sinning, well, get angry at yourself. You, you don't have to get angry at the devil. He's just doing what he does. 
we can get angry at ourselves a little bit because, in fact, we didn't have to. But the fact is, is these verses tell us what it means to overcome Satan and how to do it. First of all, we have salvation, and it's his strength. We understand that. Remember Ephesians 6.10. Be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. He, Jesus never tells us to go out there and fight like a man, or fight like a woman, or fight like whatever. Get out there and show yourself to be strong. That's not it at all. He says, go out there, but don't go out there unless you're going out there in my strength. Because if you try to fight in my strength, Satan's going to eat you for lunch. It's his strength, not your strength. It's not the strength of your will. It's not the power of your convictions. It's the strength of the resurrected Christ dwelling within you. Um, we have his strength. We belong to his kingdom. Philippians 3.20 says our, our citizenship is in heaven. Colossians 1.13, same idea. Then, as now, the power is Christ within us. It is not us. So that is how we fight. But note what is the cause of the worship. Not simply that Satan had been thrown down. They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb. God's people have overcome. God's people have always overcome. God's people always will overcome. Even those that uh, are in the tribulation period, they get saved during the tribulation period, they will overcome as well. How do they do it? By the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. Uh, Sweet, in his comment uh, on Revelation chapter 12 here, says, The victory of the martyrs marks the failure of Satan's endeavors. Go ahead and kill them. Kill all of them that you want. You will not gain the upper hand on this. This overcoming takes us back again to John chapter 16, verse 33. It says, I've overcome the world. You will too. Brian's paraphrase. John Walbert also comments here, the accusations of Satan are nullified by the blood of the Lamb, which renders the believer pure and makes possible his spiritual victory. I like the sound of that. The accusations of Satan are nullified by the blood of the Lamb, which renders the believer pure and makes possible his spiritual victory. Now, the key to this, perhaps, is found at the end of verse 11. They did not love their lives to the death. Now, you can see this attitude throughout the New Testament. What does it mean to not love your life even to the death? The Apostle Paul gives us some insight in this. Acts chapter 20, verses 20 to 24. Nah, 22 to 24. This is the Apostle Paul. He's speaking to the elders of the church in Ephesus, and he's leaving them. And he's probably not going to see them again, so he's giving them a little farewell speech. And he says in Acts chapter 20, picking it up in verse 22, he says, And see now I go bound in the Spirit to Jerusalem, not knowing the things that will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies in every city, saying that chains and tribulations are me. Now, how would you like that if you got up every day and you prayed, Lord, what do you have for me today? And God responded by saying, chains and tribulations. You'd be like, I'm not even going to leave my house today. And the Apostle Paul says, I can't wait to go. Chains and tribulations await me. Why? Why? How, how could a man say the things that he says? Well, here it is, verse 24. But none of these things move me. Nor do I count my life dear to myself, so that I may finish my race with joy, and the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. He loved not his life to the death. You, go ahead and kill me. Kill me all you want. Kill me all day. Kill me a thousand times over. I'm going to do what I've come here to do. And the fact is, is what was Paul doing? You know, the very same thing that you and I are supposed to do too. You know, we look at somebody like the Apostle Paul and we think, well, that was Paul. I'm just me. <laughs> But you've got the same calling, Matthew chapter 28, 19, and 20. You've got the same calling to go into all the world, preach the gospel, make disciples. As it says, you have the same responsibility to go out and to share Christ, the free gift of salvation with the lost and a dying world. Why don't we do that? Well, sometimes it's because we love our lives and we don't want to die. We love our life. We love the way that we got things going here. We don't want to interrupt it. We don't want to you know, put people off. We don't want to anger people. We don't want people to think less of us. I can give you a thousand reasons why. Take your pick. You have to answer it for yourself. How come I never talk about Jesus with anybody? Why is that? Well, you, 
you take it up with the Lord. It's not between you and me, it's between you and Him. Why don't I ever talk with Jesus or talk about Jesus with anybody? Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. The Apostle Paul, once again, Galatians 2.20. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Now, Brian's paraphrase is, I've been slightly bruised with Jesus. And I still live a whole lot, and I let Jesus out once in a while too. That's kind, of, that's kind of like my paraphrase of that verse. But the Apostle Paul stands there and says, I'm dead. Saul of Tarsus died. I'm now Paul the Apostle. Have you ever wanted, and I, I, maybe I brought this up before. You know, when you get saved, I kind of like the idea of getting a new name. Because it really delineates that transformation that takes place between what I once was and what I now am. And that's sometimes, in my way of thinking anyways, is one of the difficulties that we have as a modern 21st century American believer, is we believe, but there's no transformation. You know, where's that change? Where's that moment <laughs> where I was once a sinner under the wrath of God, and now I'm saved and I'm underneath His grace? Where is that moment where I move from death to life, from dark to light? Where is that moment? Now, I'll grant you this. For some believers, it's not just a single moment in time. It might have been a day. It might have been a week. It might have been a month. But there was a transition that happened somewhere. And sometimes the difficulty that we have as believers is we don't really have that moment of transition in our life. So there's no real transformation. There's intellectual acquiescence, you know. We, we all believe, yes, we believe, we say that we believe, but where's the transformation? Where's the change? Where's the I once was that, I'm not that anymore, I am this now. And I'm not simply talking about I've changed my behavior, because anybody can change their behavior. I'm talking about being transformed by the resurrected Christ by the power of God's Holy Spirit in a way that I could never have been transformed myself. Philippians chapter 1, verse 21, the Apostle Paul writes this, For me to live is Christ, to die is gain. Um, we don't know too much about that in our lives. Now, this is the same counsel that was given to the church in Smyrna in Revelation chapter 2, verse 10. The fear of death is one of Satan's greatest weapons. They love not their lives to the death. But it's the fear of death that Satan uses against us every day. As a matter of fact, it is the core of any kind of, and my example that I wrote in my notes, particularly because it's easy, is Islamic terrorism. It counts on the fact that we don't want to die. And it counts on the fact that they're not too worried about dying. You know, what, what can you do with somebody who's not afraid to die. Nothing. And in the case of something like Islamic terrorism, and of course they're not the only ones, but they're the most easy to identify, is not only they don't, they don't care if they die, they intend on killing at the same time. So what can you do about somebody that is intent on killing who's not afraid to die? Not a lot. You can give them their wish, and that's about it. But what Islamic terrorism counts on is it counts on the fact that we don't want to die and that we don't want to kill. That's what they're counting on. The fear of death. What's the greatest thing that anyone can ever threaten another human being with? I'm going to kill you. I'm going to kill you. Or torture. <laughs> but even that only has a limited appeal because they only torture you for so long then you're no fun anymore because you just die. You know, so <laughs> He wasn't any fun, he just died, tortured him as long as I could. The saints of the tribulation period, who overcome Satan by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, they're going to have a choice to make. At this particular point, about the midway point of the tribulation period, they're going to have a choice between Christ and death. You can become a Christian and die, or you can remain not a Christian and you can live. Take your pick. That's the choice that they're going to face in that moment. Now, we as, as American believers have never faced the possibility of death over our relationship with Christ. We have. I, I never have. 
No one's ever said to me, you're a Christian, I'm going to kill you. Uh, I have had people say, if you don't shut up, I'm going to kill you. <laughs> but no, no one's ever said, you're a Christian, I'm going to kill you. It's never happened. But I certainly know people that it has happened to. And there's nothing like, I should say, there's, there's nothing that purifies the church like persecution. Nothing like it. And I've been in third world countries, communist countries, where the church is regularly persecuted. And I'm telling them it's a pure church. Now, they're not completely without their faults. They certainly have their own. But I've thought many times that probably the best thing that could ever happen to the church in America is we could get persecuted. Because it really shakes the tree. It shakes out a lot of the dead wood and a lot of the bad fruit. And the only people that remain then are the people that really, really love Jesus. And are ready to love Jesus and love not their lives to the death. Amen. Go ahead and take my life. Do whatever you want. Because to, to live is Christ, but to die is gain for me. So you can kill me if you like. Now, there are two parts to this. Again, I've mentioned it numerous times here. The blood of the Lamb. That, of course, is the finished work of Christ on the cross and His resurrection, believed on in faith, and then causing the transformation of the individual by God's Spirit. That's what the blood of the Lamb does. Transformation of the individual by God's Spirit. John 3, 3, Romans 10, 9 and 10, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. If anyone's in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things passed away, all things become new. Then, the word of their testimony. Now, this is their consistent stand for Christ in spite of persecution or death. That's what that is. They, they, they overcome him by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. Their consistent stand for Christ in spite of persecution or death. Albert Barnes comments on this verse like this. The faithful testimony which they bore to the truth. That is, they adhered to the truth in their sufferings. They declared their belief in it even in the pains of martyrdom. And it was by this that they overcame the great enemy. That is... By this, that the belief in the gospel was established and maintained in the world. You ever read church history? You ever read the history of martyrs of the faith over the last 2,000 years? It's mind-boggling. You cannot make movies more dramatic than the stories of some of the saints throughout history and the things that they suffered for the sake of the gospel. Preaching the gospel while their body is being consumed by flames as they're being burned alive. And they're preaching the gospel. Not me, I'm screaming for mercy, you know, but you got people standing in the flames proclaiming the gospel to all who would listen. The testimony of the saints in the face of tribulation and death for 2,000 years has inspired us. Read church history. Read the stories of past martyrs and saints. Read their stories and, and examine your own life and let them inspire you. How can they do what they did? If we were facing the same situation, would we be able to do the same thing? Well, I would say yes, because we're saved by the same Christ, covered by the same blood, empowered by the same Holy Spirit. Same as Paul, same as every other saint that's ever given their life throughout history. We look at their lives, we read their stories and think, I could never do that. And the answer is, of course you could. Of course you could. Same Jesus, same empowering this Holy Spirit, same strength, same power, same <laughs> overcoming. You've got a testimony too, you've got the blood of the Lamb. And until we have it, until we face the same thing, we're never really, really going to know. But if we had to, we'd find out. We'd find out that we're covered by that same blood and that we have a testimony as well. Now, therefore, therefore, verse 12, therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. Why? Because the saints have triumphed and that's reason for rejoicing. But at the same time, that this voice says, Rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. At the same time it says, Woe to you who dwell, in, or woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea. For the devil has come down to you having great wrath, because he knows that he has a short time. There's a woe at the same time. Satan will now direct his full fury here onto earth. And as a Bible believer, yes, I refer to Satan as a Bible believer, because not only did he question God's word in Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 to 5, he misquotes God's word back to Jesus in Matthew chapter 4, verse 6. James 2, 19 says, the Demons believe, but they tremble at the word of God. So Satan knows God's word, and he knows that his time is short. So verse 12 closes with a very angry devil <coughs> and an earth that is going to suffer for it. That brings me to my last point. 
point number seven, whenever the pastor says, this is my last point, you say amen. Amen. Then you take off your shoes, put your feet up, and get ready for a long finish. Amen, brother. <laughs> point number seven, the persecution of Israel. Verses 13 to 17. Now when the dragon saw that he'd been cast to the earth, he persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child. Well, we've already identified the woman as being Israel. Satan is cast down to earth. Uh, it's not, of course, that he hasn't been here. He has, but it's that his heavenly access is now closed off. So he's only got one realm to operate in, and it's here. He now turns his attention fully to the woman whom we've seen, of course, as Israel. And this may be, uh, and there's some questions, but I think it's a pretty good cross-reference. This may be exactly what Jesus was talking about in Matthew chapter 24, verses 15 to 22. Matthew chapter 24, verses 15 to 22. Remember, the woman is given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness to her place where she is nourished for time, times and half times from the presence of the servant. That's three and a half years. Is this what Jesus is referring to? This flight of, of the people of God, the Jews, their flight into the wilderness. Is that what Jesus is talking about in Matthew 24, in verse 15, when he says, Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, that's the midway point of the tribulation period, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, we've already been talking about that, whoever reads, let him understand, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let him who is on the housetop not go down to take anything out of the house. Let him who is in the field not go back to get his clothes. But woe to those who are pregnant and those who are nursing babes in those days. And pray that your flight may not be in the winter or on the Sabbath. Is that what Jesus is talking about there, here in Revelation chapter 12? I think it's not a bad speculation at all. Israel has always been a special target of Satan because they are God's chosen people. And God's chosen people have been God's channel for his revelation of himself to the world, his word, his son, and ultimately judgment upon the earth. Israel was and will be once again ground zero for everything that God's doing in this world. Now when God promised Abraham blessings in Genesis chapter 12 verses 1 to 3, Satan seemed to have gone into high gear with the cursings. Whatever it was that God wanted to do with the people of God, His chosen people, the Jews, starting with Abraham, Satan just went into high gear looking for anything that he could do to disrupt that. So with even a cursory view of history, there is hardly a century that has gone by that did not see the perse persecution of Jews to a greater or lesser degree. I, I did just like 20 minutes worth of research on this online, and I could not find a century in history where there was not persecution of the Jews. They are the most consistently persecuted people throughout the history of this planet, persecuted to, to a, a disproportionate degree. There's always been persecution of different people groups by other people groups, but the persecution of the Jews has been completely off the chart as far as disproportionate is concerned. Now, whether it's Pharaoh killing Jewish babies, Herod trying to do the same, you know, the story of the book of Esther, uh, trying to wipe out the Jews there. You, you can find it not only in biblical history, but you can find it throughout uh, secular history as well. Now, in the second half of the tribulation period, because remember, in the parenthetical chapters of 10 to 14, we are paused at the midway point of the tribulation period. So here we are, the Antichrist has made an agreement with the people of Israel. He's been able to help them rebuild their temple in Jerusalem. He is ruling and reigning. And then, what's called the abomination of desolation at the midway point of the tribulation period, he walks into the temple in Jerusalem, and he claims to be God incarnate, and then everybody has to worship him. Now, somewhere along the line, this agreement got made with the people of Israel, and there are people in Israel, there are people of the Jewish faith that are going to consider that whoever helps them rebuild their temple will be the Messiah. He will be their Messiah. At the midway point, that all changes when he reveals himself for who he is. And the people of Israel that have believed in him will realize that they hitched their cart to the wrong pony, so to speak. Now in Romans chapter 11, God's word makes clear that he was and still is and will again use the nation of Israel. 
There are many that believe in what we refer to sometimes as a replacement theology, that, uh, that the church has replaced Israel in the plan of God, God's done with Israel, not going to do anything with them ever again. That simply is not true. Romans chapter 11 makes that clear. What Romans 11 does make clear, along with Revelation 12, 17, is that there is and will be a remnant of Israel that will be preserved. There has always been a remnant of Israel that has been preserved. They will not be wiped out. How does God do it? Verse 14. The woman was given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness. Now, we might not be certain about some of the details, how these details actually play out, but we can speculate, I think, fairly well. The wings here that are given to this woman, uh, like an eagle, symbolize flight. Um, and what they symbolize, it symbolizes literal flight. Not simply running away, but actually getting up into the air and flying away. Many have speculated that that is a reference to some sort of an airlift. That they're going to be moved via airlift out of the given area. Is that true? I don't know. God can pick them up and move them if he wants to, any way he wants to do it. So whether he wants to use the wings of a literal eagle or whether he wants to use aircraft, it doesn't matter to me. Now, ultimately, I think it doesn't matter, although I think the speculation <coughs> that it's an airlift of some sort, I think it's good speculation, so I can, I can roll with that. But also, too, uh, well, I want to mention this, too. There's a similar figure of speech that's used in Exodus 19.4 and Deuteronomy 32.11 and 12. So there is some biblical precedent for this idea of flying away from trouble. Uh, next, this flight takes her to her place. There in verse 14, it's described as her place. This is a place that is specifically designated by God for this remnant of Israel to get to where they can be safe from the persecution of this dragon. I had mentioned before that a lot of speculation is centered around uh, the Jordanian city of Petra. Uh, that it, it presents a unique situation that can actually shelter many, many, many people in a very unique and secure setting. Um, is it possible that it's Petra? I, I have no idea. It's fanciful. Uh, it's not bad speculation if you're thinking where, where can God move this many people that they're going to be in a place that's safe and secure. Uh, Petra's not a, bad, not a bad call. But wherever it is, it's a place that God has designed and a, a place that God has made specific. Her place, it's called in verse 14. Now, whatever that, that is, wherever it is, however it happens, the Jewish people are cared there in supernatural fashion, not unlike manna from the sky, not unlike water from the rock. God's going to take care of them for three and a half years. That's stated here as a time, times and half a time. Um, Satan can't touch them in this place. God is giving them a protection. But that doesn't necessarily stop him from trying. Verses 16 and 17. Uh, or in verse 15, the serpent spewed water out of his mouth like a flood after the woman that he might cause her to be carried away by the flood. Now, this flood thing, is this a literal flood? Is it a flood of water or does it symbolize something else? Don't really know. Uh, God has certainly used water to judge the earth before he said that he never would. Doesn't mean that Satan won't try. Can Satan cause a flood to happen? Of course he can cause a flood to happen. But God counters with a little bit of help of his own. God owns the earth, and the earth is going to play by God's rules and not Satan's rules. So can we see this as Satan releasing a literal flood, and the earth literally opening up and swallowing up this literal flood that Satan sends after this woman as she is fleeing to try to wipe her out? Can we see it that way? Absolutely. I got no trouble with that at all. I always love it when people come up to me and say, you actually believe that stuff? I'm like, yeah. You don't? <laughs> I do. <laughs> I have no trouble with it at all. My God can do anything that he wants to. How about your God? That's my thoughts. So how, how does this actually, what does this actually look like in time? In, in earthly time, what does this actually look like? Don't really know. Some choose the symbolic interpretation of this flight and flood. Uh, some have suggested that the flood represents just Satan's full force of persecution. It's not actual water. And she's not actually flying away to some other geographical location. It's all symbolic. Could be. But that is not to say, of course, either that uh, every Jewish person on earth gets saved at the same time. Zechariah chapter 13, verses 8 and 9 indicates that two-thirds of the people of Israel will perish. So people are going to die. 
a lot of people are going to die. One clear indication of this is seen, of course, in verse 17. The dragon was enraged with the woman, and he went to make war with the rest of her offspring. So they don't all make it to this place of refuge. They don't all get there. And, of course, we can't forget from Revelation 7, the 144,000 that were already sealed. They're Jewish too, and they can't be harmed. So it appears that what makes it to safety is a remnant. While many remain outside of this kind of supernatural protection, again, we can look back to Matthew 24, 15 to 22 for some insight on that. Now, whatever the interpretation is, however this actually plays out you know, in our real world, uh, when it actually happens, it is clear that Israel will become, once again, the target of massive persecution. But, with the miraculous intervention of God, a remnant will be saved. That is the historical precedent for what God has done with Israel. But here in verse 17, Satan target, Satan's target widens to include Jewish believers as well. So remember, the dragon was enraged with the woman, went off to make war with the rest of her <coughs> offspring. Who are they? Those who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. So now the persecution of both Jews and Christians ramps up to a supernatural level. This <coughs> offspring makes me think about um, Romans chapter 11, verse 16 to 24. Uh, about the uh, wild olive branches being grafted onto the natural olive tree. If you guys have ever read the passage before, you know that as a Christian, we owe a debt of love to our natural olive tree, which is the Jewish people. Biblical Christianity has its roots deep in Judaism. Judaism is the roots of Christianity. And from Abraham on, we are children of faith. Romans 2, 28 and 29, uh, in a fascinating passage about what makes a Jew a Jew, the Apostle Paul puts it like this, Romans 2, 28 and 29, for he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh, but he is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit, not in the letter, whose praise is not from men, but from God. Or Galatians chapter 3, Galatians 3, verse 29. Galatians 3, 29, where God's word says, And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. That is why we as believers have a natural affection for Israel and for her people throughout history. That does not mean that we always agree with them or with their actions politically or even religiously. And it doesn't mean that the church hasn't throughout history had its own share of anti-Semitism and persecution of the Jews, because it has, specifically the history of the Roman Catholic Church. But biblically, the Jews are still God's chosen people. And in the case of the tribulation, with Jerusalem as ground zero, the Jews once again face persecution, but this time Christians will face the same thing, side by side, with them. For those who come to Christ for salvation during the tribulation period, the midway point is a turning point. What was once difficult now becomes light and death. Being a Christian is difficult. It's not easy. I think it was um, G.K. Chesterton who said that it's not that Christianity has been tried and found wanting, but it's been tried, it's been found hard and not tried at all. Let's see if I can get that right. It's not that Christianity has been tried and found wanting. It's been found difficult and not tried at all. Being Christian is one of the hardest things in the world to do. In the tribulation period, it will cost someone their life. I can choose to become a Christian, be saved for all eternity. The transformation of my heart, my life, my soul, my life, everything. And die. Be killed. Be persecuted because of that. Or I can just keep going with the flow, with the rest of humanity, and stay out of trouble. What was once difficult now becomes life and death. Taken together, chapter 12 gives us a very full introduction to what we're about to read in chapters 13 and 14, where we dig deeper into the characters of the Antichrist and the false prophet. Friends, you don't want to miss chapter 13 and 14, because this is where we're going to lay the last of the groundwork in the parenthetical chapters before we move on and complete.
what the book of Revelation says about the tribulation period. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have the plan. That your plan, as difficult as it may be to accept or even understand, to understand that your plan is perfection. Now, Lord, I pray that even for us here tonight, that we would not love our lives, even to death. Or that we would be willing to stand up with that kind of boldness, not fearing what anyone can do to us. Because we're safe and secure with you for all eternity. Lord, help us labor, not simply for the reward, but, Lord, that you really are going to reward us. Help us to be mindful of that. We would build and work and labor with your glory in mind. And with that day when we'll stand before you, the judgment seat of Christ, to receive that reward. Lord, we want to be able to stand there and hear you say, well done, good and faithful servant. So again, Lord, grant us the power of your Holy Spirit to be the people that you call us to be. Use us, even this day, use us this week, Lord, to be ambassadors for you to this lost and dying world. Lord, let's save some more this week, we pray. In Jesus' name.